Good morning, everybody. I'm sure that everybody be feeling a little cooler today. It certainly does me good, and I praise the Lord for it because I feel as if I can move, but not in the last few days. It's time for our prayer now, and I'd ask you to kneel if you can, otherwise adopt the attitude of prayer, please. Father in heaven, we're glad that we have come here today to worship you. And we want to praise you that we can sing, that we can give an offering, and that we can fellowship with other people here today, those of like faith. Today, Lord, we want to thank you for two things, or many things, but especially for Eleanor, who has had her operation, and that the outcome is not as bad as it might have been. But we ask, Lord, that you will bless her and help her as she goes through the next lot of treatment which is coming to her in time. We ask that, Lord, you will uphold her and help her in this time. And Annette also, Lord, we pray for her. She's had her operation and at home now, but, Lord, we pray that you will help her too, that she will look to you for strength. As we all must look to you for strength, Lord, we don't know what will be befalling us through this new year, Lord, but we know that things are not getting better in the world. We think of the people in Australia who would never, ever have imagined that such a deluge would have caused so much trouble for them, Lord. And we think, too, of the people in Christchurch who are suffering, too, that it must be very nerve-wracking to have these shakes all the time. And how can they rebuild when this is, this is happening all the time? So, Lord, we pray that you will help each one of us, each one of the families represented here, each of the children, the mothers with little children, that you will bless them and help them as they try to educate and bring up their little ones. We think of the world work, Lord, that is happening in the world, we know that your spirit must go before you can come and we pray that there will be many who will be ready for you because they have seen and known that the prophecies are true. And so, Lord, we pray today that you will help us in our endeavours as we meet with people, help us to have the right words to speak at the right time. And Lord, we think too, again, of the wonderful sacrifice that you have made for each one of us. We don't understand it. We don't understand such love that you had for each one of us. And we think of all the millions and millions of people who have been on this earth and that you know each one of them. And Lord, we, we praise you for it and we ask that you will bring a great number into your church and that they will be ready to meet you when you come. And so we ask for the forgiveness of our sins, please. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. I think we can do a little bit better than that. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Morning. Amen. So some of us are awake this morning. Praise the Lord. It's good to be here in Whangarei. I noticed uh, in the lovely prayer that was just prayed, you happened to mention Christchurch. And that's where I, myself, my wife, my friend Ashley and Luke are from. And I don't know if anyone else here this morning is from Christchurch, but I can assure you that the earthquake was quite a frightening experience. Uh, happened at 4.35 a.m. in the morning. By the grace of God, he had woken me up at 4 a.m. I was on my knees in my lounge room praying, and I could hear the rumble coming from the distance. I started to think, what is that? It sounded like a tsunami. And I've been around some big waves in my times, and I was like, no, no, it's not a wave. And then I started to feel the bright vibrations in the floor, and I realized an earthquake was coming, and it was pretty amazing. The whole house just started to sway back and forward, and... It's hard to describe it unless you're in it, but it was quite terrifying. So 
Yeah, I just am happy to have been away for the last two months on the road to not have to worry about the um, ramifications of that. I've had over a couple of thousand aftershocks now. So uh, I suppose hopefully they'll be over by the time we get back in a couple of weeks. But yeah, thanks to you for thinking of Christchurch and your prayers. We appreciate that. I uh, just want to do, before I start my message, just want to share with you a little bit what, about what we're doing. Uh, God gave me a vision a few months ago to walk the length of this country to give people hope as the alternative to committing suicide. Walking is not something that I'm truly fond of, so therefore I knew that it was obviously God's will. God came to me and uh, as I was out walking one morning, I'd been spending more and more time in prayer and more and more time in my word and I, the word of God, and I felt impressed to start walking. And as I started to walk, uh, I felt impressed that I needed to walk for those of my friends who have committed suicide and also for my 17-year-old cousin who took her life by suicide. And God gave me the vision and told me the name Dare to Hope. That's how the name came about. He just spoke that name to me. And I went home that day and I purchased that name for $19 because no one had that website name and then started to construct, construct a website and the rest is history basically. Here we are. We've, I've covered now some, I think about 1,800 and something kilometres. Um, total walk is 2,012. And it's just been amazing it's been amazing, the people that we've been able to connect with, people we've been able to meet, and everyone's got a story, and I just really enjoy doing life with others, and it's just been such a blessing, more than I could ever have possibly, uh, possibly imagined in the beginning. So that's why we're here, and I'm using this wedge, People Committing Suicide, um, as a wedge to present the gospel, to give them the hope of Jesus Christ, our only true hope, and it, uh, I believe it seems to be working. There's been some 2,000 hits a day on our uh, website, Facebook page. So obviously the message is getting across, I believe. And one story I'll share with you now is that when we were walking out of the district of Taupo, a young lady, approximately 19 years of age, pulled over and uh, talked to us and asked us what we were doing. And uh, a couple of days later, we got an email saying how she was on her way home to actually commit suicide and that meeting us saved her life. So praise God, amen. So praise the Lord. So let us, if you wouldn't mind, just have another word of prayer and I'll start this morning's message. If anyone has any questions, please ask us afterwards. I'm more than willing to share. Dear Lord, Father, we just praise you and thank you that we can be here in your sanctuary this morning. Lord, your word tells us that where two or more people are gathered in your name, that you, are Lord, are there among them, even in the midst of them, Lord. You tell us, Lord, that you will not leave us or forsake us, that you will guide us with your eye, Lord. You instruct us in righteousness, Lord, and right living, right doing, like right acting. Oh, Lord, what a privilege it is to be your child, to be part of this movement, Lord, to be part of this family, to know that we have a real hope, a blessed hope. We look forward, Lord, to your coming, and each one of us, I'm sure, wants to make it to heaven. And we can because you have made a way possible for rescuing us, God. What amazing thing grace is, Lord. Not that any one of us deserve it in this room, Lord, but it's a gift freely given by you. I pray this morning, Lord, as we present this message about conversion, that you would just remove myself, Lord, and that they would not see the messenger, but just hear the message that you have this morning. May you bless us now, in Jesus Christ's name we ask and pray. Amen. I'll be speaking this morning about true conversion. I believe that's what we need, the only thing that we need and the only thing that we'll ever need. I stand in front of you this morning not because of any great thing that I have done or because of any great achievement that I might have had, I stand in front of you this morning because I can honestly say that I am having a conversion experience with Jesus Christ. And my question to you this morning is, are you? I believe that the whole purpose of meeting together like this every Sabbath should be to f for one reason and one reason alone. And that I believe that it's to find something that maybe you don't already have. Maybe it's to be inspired or to be encouraged to be greatly impacted in hearing something new. That is my reason for getting out of bed and coming to church on the Sabbath morning. I need to be challenged. I need to hear something that will change my life forever. I hope that's your reason for coming to church this morning. Talking on conversion, before we're able to have this experience, we must be willing to die to self. And so often we hear this phrase, you must be willing to die to self. But what does that really mean? Many of us, I believe, will never know a radical Christian experience because we always want to be in control. Are you one of those people? We always want to be in control. But the great paradox of the Christian adventure is that 
The only time that you will ever experience a true fulfillment of what God has for you is when you are out of control and when God is in control. Let us look at some Bible verses this morning about conversion. If you want to open your Bibles now to the book of Psalms, the 34th chapter, starting in verse 8. Psalms, chapter 34, reading in verse 8. Remembering the only time that you're in control is when you're out of control and God is in control. Let us read here about conversion from a man who knew well. O oh, taste and see, verse 8, that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Let me read it again. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Taste and see. It's incredible godly counsel. It doesn't say here to take somebody else's opinion for it. It says you taste and you see. In other words, find out for yourself. For 21 years of my life, I believed the biggest lie that any man, woman or child could be sold. And that was that my life had no relevance, that I had no purpose, that I had no hope beyond this world. That is a lie. But it wasn't until I tasted and seen for myself that I understood that I am somebody, that I'm a child of God, that I have a real hope, a blessed hope. But only through tasting and spending time have I found that out. Taste. Stop worrying about what other people say or what other people might think about. what you... Forget all that. Taste yourself. And you will see the second part of the verse. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Oh, how blessed my life has been the last nine years since becoming a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And I'm so proud to say that this morning. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian because we have the light and truth through the Bible and a spirit of prophecy. Amen? The truth has set me free. Blessed is the man. I wouldn't give up the last 10 weeks on the road for the first 21 years of my life. And that wasn't to say that I had an ordinary or an opaque life. That wasn't the case. You know, I used to travel the world surfing the best waves. I reached the mountain top of my goals and my dreams, my aspirations. Still didn't complete me. It wasn't until I met Jesus Christ that I found what I was looking for. John chapter 10, verse 10. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The fourth gospel. As we continue on our conversion experience here this morning. Some of your Bibles may have the words written in red. The thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they may have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The thief, that's referring to the devil, Satan, he comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus, the I am, he says, I am come that they, that's talking about you and I, might have life. What kind of a life? They may have it more abundantly. Have you ever read this verse and pondered on it and understood through it that there is actually here only two options? Option number one, the first part of the verse, the thief, the devil comes not but to steal, kill and to destroy. That is his plan for each and every one of us that is sitting or standing here this morning. The devil wants to use you, abuse you, refuse you, and turn you into refuse. This world is not our friend. We have a heaven to win, amen? And we have a hell to shun. It is by the grace of God that you're able to be here this morning. He is sustaining you every single second, every minute, every hour of the day. We're here by the mercy of God. The devil hates every one of you. Don't ever think he's your friend. Young people, and there's a couple in this room. This world's not your friend. Don't think the grass is greener on the other side. Been there, done that. It's not. It's not. There's nothing out there. And I'll illustrate that further later on in my presentation. But what does Jesus say? Jesus here says, But I, 
I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The Christian experience is not an ordinary experience. It's not like riding a bus. That's how I ride a bus. Don't, I don't enjoy riding buses. It's not like that. That frown will be turned up the other way. It's an incredible experience. I'm not saying that it's a bed of roses, but I'm saying that God promised to give you peace and joy and patience and kindness and goodness and long-suffering. There's nothing like it. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. And that's what Jesus is offering us, an awesome life. And one I want to present and say to you this morning is that there's only two options. If you're not experiencing what Jesus says he is offering, which is the abundant life, then something is amiss. Would you agree? Because that's what the verse is implying. He's saying, I'm offering you abundant life. That's what it's about. That's what he's offering. And the devil is offering you the exact opposite. So if you're not having abundant life this morning, we need to go home and ask ourselves, why aren't we having an abundant life? Because that's what Jesus is offering. That's what the Word is saying, is it not? These are Jesus' words, amen? I'll help you to understand it clearer. Let us look now at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Galatians, Ephesians. Chapter 3, verse 20. What does that abundant life look like? What does it look like? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now unto him, that is God, that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh within us. You know, I love this book. It's almost like Paul, when he has written this book here under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, has been lost for words. And he's thinking, how can I explain the Christian experience? And he says, it in this way, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think of. There's no human explanation for it. It's above and beyond that. That's the Christian experience. That's the Christian experience. I want to have that experience because I believe that is the experience that God is offering us. Now some of you might think, oh, this guy thinks he's got it all together. <laughs> it couldn't be further from the truth. I know that I don't have it all together. But I know I'm in a process of God changing me. And I know where I used to be some nine years ago to where I am today to stand in front of you in this pulpit. I know what my life used to be like. I know the people I used to hang out with and the places I used to go and the things I used to do. Those things no longer have any power over me. I know the music I used to listen to. It's of no interest to me anymore. Why? There's only one explanation because Christ now truly has come and is living in me, Amen. How can you go from listening to heavy metal, rock music, to loving hymns and hating and despising that type of music? How can you go from having casual relationships to being someone who loves his wife more than anything that he could imagine next to Jesus? Amen? Only by the grace of God. So this is my life now, but it hasn't always been this way. It hasn't always been like this. And that's why I know that I can relate with somebody that's sitting here in this congregation this morning. So what happened? How did it change and how did it happen? I want to use this illustration. When I was younger, I used to play a lot of sport. I was quite good at rugby. I used to represent Nelson Bays for my age. And if someone was to ask me, Carl, what was it like to play in front of some of those crowds? Because they used to play in grand finals, etc. So I used to play in front of some reasonable sized crowds. If someone was to say, what's it like playing in front of all those people? I would think about that for some time. Then I would give them this answer. 
The truth is, I don't really know what it's like to play in front of all of those people and play in front of those crowds. Because I wasn't playing to the crowds. I was playing to the coach. Amen? How many of us are still playing to the crowds? Maybe it's your husband's expectations, or your wife's expectations, or your child's expectations, or because you hold a church position, or because you're a second or third generational Adventist. Because if that is your situation today, I can tell you that most probably you are not having the abundant life, but rather having a miserable Christian experience. I want to illustrate this point even further. Let us go back to the book of Luke and let the word speak on behalf of itself. Luke, the 15th chapter. It's time that we start applying to the coach, amen? Coach Jesus. Stop worrying about the crowds. Luke chapter 15, this would be my favorite chapter in all of the Bible. We know that it's a chapter of things that have been lost. But this morning I want to focus on the second part of what is known commonly as the story of the prodigal son. But really it's a story of a loving father. A loving father. Let's pick it up here in verse 25. The elder son was in the field. This is when his other brother has come home after wasting his father's inheritance by squandering it. He was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked, What do these things mean? The servant said to him, Your brother has come home, and thy father has killed the fatted calf, because he has received him safe and sound. He was angry, and he would not go in. Therefore came his father out, and entreated him to come in. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years have I served thee, neither transgressed I at any time against thy commandments, yet thou hast never given me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which has devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. Father's response. He said to him, Son, Thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Lord, may you add a blessing to the reading of your word. What's happened here? We know that the prodigal son has come home. He squandered the father's inheritance with riotous living. And in verse 28, we see there that the older son is angry. He's angry and he wouldn't go into the house. Therefore, the father came out to see him. What was he angry at? You see, he was angry at what his brother was receiving, at his brother's treatment. You see, often I've found in my Christian experience, and I'm sure some of you can agree with me in your own experience, we become jealous of others. We become critical of others. We gossip about others. We backstab others. We're angry at what they receive. We're not happy. We judge. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Who am I to judge a fellow brother and sister in Christ? Oh, we need to learn to tame our tongue. He was upset. He was frustrated. How many people turn away from the church because... Somebody in the church has wronged them. Somebody walks into church that hasn't been here for five years, ten years. Maybe that's you this morning, I don't know. And the first thing that you think of is a critical thought. Or look at the way they're dressed. Start talking about what they've been doing. That is not godly, amen. He was critical at what his brother was receiving and his brother's experience. Verse 29, he was angry. Verse 28, verse 29 says, he answers his father again. He says, Lo, these many years have I served thee. Neither transgressed I at any time against thy commandment. And yet thou never gave me a kid that I might make and meet, make merry with my friends. What's the parallel in this this morning? Because I believe that the Bible is sharper than any double edged sword, amen. And it's not just some fancy story. This is to speak to us, to change our lives. It's what the Word of God is for. 
I believe this is the implications that it has. I've kept thy commandments. I'm talking to you, good Seventh-day Adventists now. Amen? I've turned up to church on time, some of us. <laughs> I've taken Sabbath school. I've preached sermons. I've given a tithe. I've given offering. I've done all the right things. I've been a good Adventist. But yet you've never given me anything, is what he says. Isn't it interesting with, to the Father's reply, which this Father in this story depicts God the Father, amen? He says here in verse 31, he says to him, Son, he wants to clarify now, Son, you are ever with me, and all, A, double L, underline, bold, emphasize the word, all that I have is thine. All that I have is thine. It's just he never even knew it. And do you know the reason he never knew it? Because he was too busy looking in the wrong place. We're too busy arguing about things. Well, we should be looking at Jesus Christ and what he has done. The only way that any one of us will get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Amen? You're not saved by works. That's what he's saying. I've done this, I've done that. You're not saved by works, lest any man should boast. You are saved by the gift of God. And you must accept it and understand what it is. His life, his perfect life, it doesn't matter to God if you're the best Christian in this room. It's irrelevant. You're not saved because of that. You're saved because of Christ, the risen Saviour. I'm not saying the commandments aren't important. That's not what I'm saying. Of course they're important. If you love me, keep my commandments. I keep God's commandments out of respect for him because I love him with all of my heart. Praise God for the Sabbath. What a joy, what a delight that I can worship my creator with his children. But that's not what gets me saved. What saves me is a relationship with Jesus. Let us keep our focus on him. Amen. Let us see what happens when you come home. Speaking about the prodigal here. The father, verse 22, said to his servants, Bring forth thy best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. What's this about? This is the experience when you come home. Let me explain. The robe that the Father will put on you is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. His righteousness. A new life. A life that loves doing the right thing. Like I said, you don't earn it. It's a gift. You just accept it. Amen? Put a ring on his hand. What is the ring all about? Well, I believe that that ring represents power and it represents authority. Every one of us in this church this morning is either a son or a daughter of God, the king of the universe. So if he is the king, what does that make you and I? Someone in this room is a prince and somebody else is a princess, Amy. That is your identity in Christ. Don't let the world tell you that you're nobody, that you're nothing. You're somebody this morning. A child of the king of the universe. Don't let the world steal that from you. Put your shoulders back. Walk with your head held high. Get your white pearly teeth out and show the world. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. That is your identity this morning. Let us live like children of God, amen? And he says, finally, put the shoes on his feet. Took me some time to understand what that really meant. Put the shoes on his feet. In other words, he's saying, son, when you come home, son, when you truly come home, I'm going to put the shoes on your feet. What that means is that in times past, we know that slaves never wore shoes. 
Slaves couldn't afford shoes. And they would sing songs about one day getting to heaven and having pearly slippers, amen? Golden slippers. So what he's saying is this, I believe. Carl, when you come home, put on these slippers. You're no longer a slave to sin. You'll no longer walk. This is what it's about. You'll no longer walk in that direction or lifestyle you used to live in. I'm going to give you a new life. Put the shoes on and walk with me, my son. Walk in freedom and liberty and grace and in power. That's the Christian experience. Amen. Do you believe what I'm saying? I'm not just making this up. Because I know because I'm experiencing it. I'm experiencing it. And many of you are, I know, amen. Amen. That's what it means. I call it the straighty 180. Easy to remember. The straighty 180. Turn and go the opposite direction. Those things no longer have power over you. The thing I love most about the story, though, that strikes a chord in my heart is that in both situations, it was the father who came out to meet the prodigal. It was the father who came out of the house to entreat his other son in. I don't see him there saying, Son, what did you do with all that money that I gave you? I don't read that in that verse or anywhere else in the Bible. I don't see him saying, Son, why have you wasted your inheritance? Why have you been a drunkard, a drug addict? Why have you done these things? You don't see that in the Bible. And the reason you don't see that is because there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. God is a God of love. He doesn't care what you've been doing. He just cares that you're home. And He'll fix you up, clean you up. He'll take care of you now, dust you off. And He'll make you a new man or woman. No condemnation in that Christ Jesus. Not where have you been, what have you been doing? Only love, love, glorious love. Don't you want to experience that? I know I do. I know I do. If only someone had explained this to me before I found out the truth when I was 21. Can you here relate this morning to the older brother? I know some of us can. Can you here this morning relate to the younger brother? I'm sure others can. Is it time that you started to tap into the potential and abundance that God has for you? Have you realized this morning maybe you've been missing the point altogether of what this whole Christian experience is about? Question then. We must ask ourselves, how do we actually get it? Males, like myself, are very practical people. I believe it's important to help people to be able to follow steps to have this experience. So here are the three pivotal steps that will catapult you into a realm of fulfillment that you never have could possibly imagine. Number one, prayer. Prayer is absolutely essential to the Christian. I used to pray like this, and it's okay because, you know, it's a process. Dear Lord, bless me today and bless me. Amen, Jesus. Thank you. Now that's a type of prayer, Amen. But I believe that if you want to have a relationship with somebody, you need to spend time with them. Would you agree with me, husbands out there? Wives? Don't you love it when your husband listens? You see, prayer is about communication. It's not just talking to God. It's listening as well. It's listening. We need to speak to God. And then we listen to God. Communication. Prayer is essential to the Christian. Those that seek me early shall find me. He that hungers and thirsts for righteousness shall be filled. God does not tell lies. God does not tell lies. So when he says something in his word, he actually means that 100%. If God is a liar, then I will leave this movement. But everything that I have tested God on, that I have tasted and now seen, that he says is true. It is true. Prayer 
is number one. Start your day, start your morning with Jesus. Don't wait to the end of the day. Give God the best of your day, the very beginnings of your day, and he'll set you up to have a wonderful day. Prayer, number two. Bible study. How do we do it? This is how I do it, and I'm sure you have your own other way of doing it. Maybe this might help somebody. What I do is I read the Word of God. Say, for instance, if I was to read a parable like this one here, and I would look at it through my eyes. Then I would look at it through the eyes of the father. Then I would look at it through the eyes of the prodigal. Then I would look at it the eyes of the older son. Then I would look at it through the eyes of a servant. Then I would look at it. You just have to be critical. You have to critique it, break it down. Use your brain, your intellect. God gave you that. I believe that, for me anyway, has been what has really helped me to understand who God is when I've really thoroughly unpacked a verse. I once met a man who told me he'd been studying one verse in the Bible for seven years, and I kind of, <laughs> how could that possibly be? Seven years on one verse. Then he told me what the verse was. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You can never get to the end of a verse. It's not possible. It's not possible. Study the word of God and your life will change. So we've got prayer, we've got Bible study. And number three is share. Prayer, Bible study and sharing. You see, once you've filled up on God, then you want to share that with others. Because what happens is not only does God change you, but when he changes you, he will start to change those around you because you become somebody that has an impact on others' lives. Jesus said to the disciples, follow me and I will what? Make you fishers of men. How do you truly know, and I'm about to say this and it's true, how do you truly know if you are actually a follower of Jesus Christ? Jesus himself said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. It's a pretty heavy thing to say, but I believe that's what we've been taught, amen? Not that I go out to try. I don't have to try. The thing is, it just happens naturally, because it's Christ living in you, because you put him on, and he just comes out of you. You have a smile when you go to the supermarket and talk to the checkout person. They'll look at you, how are you feeling? I'm feeling great today. Why? I'm a child of the king. What have you been doing today? I've been walking the length of this country. What? Why are you doing that? Because I believe that there is hope as an alternative to committing suicide. Hope in God. Because I have found that hope, and I'm experiencing that hope. Far out. Now you think about that. Who knows what seed that might sow, Amen. We share with others. And that's how I know that this Christian experience is true because not only is God changing my life, God is changing your life and your life and your life. Every one of us. He's changing us all. That's how I know he's real because I can see him at work in every one of us. Amen. Powerful. Powerful. So they believe, I believe that they are the three essential keys. Prayer. Bible study and share. PBS. PBS. I want to finish with this story this morning. I want to finish with this story. There was a father and a son. This father loved his son, his only son. Very, very wealthy man. So wealthy, in fact, he could acquire all kinds of expensive paintings and artworks. This is based on a true story, time of the Vietnam War. Now what happened was, this man's son was drafted to go to war. And he went and did what he thought was right for his country. And he went to war and fought bravely and gallantly for what he believed was right. But unfortunately... Some time after that war had begun, the old man went out one day from his mansion to the letterbox 
And as he opened into his letterbox, he took something out. And as he touched it with his hands and looked upon it with his eyes, he realized that this letter was addressed from the U.S. Army. He was afraid to open it. As he opened this letter, his worst thoughts became a reality. It said there in that letter, I'm sorry to inform you, but your son has died in combat. Your son, your only son has died in combat. Oh, oh, how the father's heart was broken. Many of you have had that experience possibly. We have lost somebody dear to you. He was unconsolable and he sat there in his living room weeping and weeping and weeping. Some time later, there came a knock on his door. And he opened that door and there was a man standing there in his U.S. Army suit, prim and proper. He didn't know that man. The man said, listen, I'm Lieutenant so-and-so. I knew your son. We fought together in Vietnam. He was a good soldier, a brave man. And I brought you something today. I want you to have something. He told me how you were a famous art collector. Wow. I never could have possibly imagined anything like this, though. And when it came time to leave, after I'd had a com good conversation there for hours, and how the father's heart was thrilled to meet somebody who knew known his son, that man there said, I'm just an amateur artist, but I've got something for you. And he rolled out a scroll that he had with him. And he said, I want you to have this. And he handed it to the old man. And the old man opened up that painting. And it was a painting of his son. His son. And he was thrilled. Oh, he got those expensive paintings and he moved them aside and he put that amateur painting in the most focal point of his living room. And he would spend hours and hours and hours on end staring at it, contemplating it. Oh, a reminder of his son. That old man passed away. And there was an auction for his paintings. People came from all across the world to buy these lavish paintings. And as they were seated, the auctioneer said, there's just one small matter of importance we must take care of before we start this auction today. And he rolled out that amateur painting's artwork. And they said, oh, what artist is this? We've not seen this before. And he said, no, no, this is... Just an amateur artist's paintwork of the old man who used to own this mansion, all these paintings, his son. Ah, oh, get on with it. Hurry up. We've come here to buy these expensive paintings. This matter of business must be taken care of. Will anyone bid on this painting? And down in the far corner, there was an old man there. Actually, it was the janitor. And he put his hand up and he said, I'd like to bid. I only have a couple of dollars. I'd like to bid on that painting. I knew the boy. And he said, anyone else? Going once, going twice, sold to that man in the far corner. And the gavel came down. That's it. This auction is now over. And everyone went up and up. What do you mean it's over? He said, I was under strict, strict orders that whosoever brought this Painting, the painting of the sun, this amateur artwork, this picture, whoever brought this painting would get everything, everything. You see, my brothers and sisters, whosoever has the sun has life. If you have Jesus Christ, you get everything. Not just in this world, by the way. You get eternity. Eternity is a long time. And there's no reason why any one of us shouldn't be there. Our king is coming to take us home. The general, the conqueror, our lovely Lord and Savior. And he's coming soon. Signs of the times declare to us that Jesus is on his way. Jesus is on his way. 
Are you ready? Are you ready? Or you, will you be one of those foolish people who will say, rocks fall on us, fall on us. There's no reason any one of us should be in that category. God has done everything. What more can he do? He sent his only son for you, for me. God is love. Love. No words can describe his love. Will you be there? The decision lies with you, and God will not force you this morning or any morning. The decision lies with you alone. Has this morning's message been clear to you? I believe the message that has been sent from this pulpit this morning has been the message received. I believe some of us probably, myself included, need to go home and make some resolute decisions. God doesn't want to take things out of our life that are good for us. He, wanted, he wants to take away things in our life that are bad for us, that are holding us back from becoming who he wants us to be. He wants us to reach our full potential. He wants us to show this world what it truly means to be a seventh-day Adventist. Are you proud to call yourself a seventh-day Adventist this morning? I'm proud of who I am. I'm proud of what the counterplied millions of people have done for me so that I can hold this precious Bible in my hand. I'm proud of our history. And I know that this church is going through, amen? This church is going through. Let's be in that number, shall we? If it is your desire this morning to go all the way with Jesus, would you please stand with me? If it is your desire to go all the way with Jesus, please stand with me now. Praise God, amen. Praise the Lord. Now God knows the desires of your heart. And I'm not making an appeal for me. It's about Jesus. He understands each one of us. Let's tap into the potential he has. And let's see that abundant life. Amen. Let us sing our final hymn, which is hymn number 526. Because he lives. Because he lives. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 14. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh, Lord, we thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, for each and every one of us, Lord. You came into this world to rescue us, Lord. Sinners, Lord, of whom I'm chief. To give us a real life a real chance, a real opportunity, real abundance, real power, Lord. Oh, Lord, what a privilege it is to be your child. Your child. Father, this morning, you have called out to each one of us, Lord. You have not appealed to us in a an emotional way, Lord, but you've spoken to our minds, Lord, in a logical way, in a rational way, Lord, as intelligent human beings, which we are. And you're calling us home, your remnant, Lord, your people, God. You're preparing us, Lord, for the last crisis, which is about to break upon us very, very soon. Lord, may each one of us be ready Please, Lord, do whatever it takes, Father. I would rather go to heaven, Lord, maimed than not be in heaven at all. 
And you will do that, Lord, because you are merciful and gracious. And you will never leave us or forsake us, God. But ultimately, the choice lies with us. And you will not force your will upon anyone, Lord. But in love, you coerce us to you. And I pray, Lord, this morning, that we would respond to your love, that we would truly respond to your love, and that we would never be the same again. It's not, Lord, about having good information, even if we could memorize the whole Bible. What we need here this morning, Lord, is a heart transformation. Make these dry bones to live again, Lord. Breathe on us, God. And rain your spirit down and conform our characters, Lord, to represent you before this world who is so tragically lost and broken in absolute despair. Help us, Lord. Please, Lord, help us to finish the work so you can come. Let all the saints of God say, Amen.